The people of God were stuck. For centuries, they lived as slaves to terrifying taskmasters whose cruelty was only exceeded by their power. In these dark days, God's people gave birth to children who would inherit nothing more than misery. Their strongest ally was a God whom they had assumed had forgotten them. Far from forgotten, the people of God were rescued by the might of his hand. He put their masters to open shame and led them into the wilderness. Though they were set free, they weren't yet living free. They started to live as slaves to their own sin. What happened next reverberates for over 3,000 years of history to this current day. Like a loving and patient father, God instructed his children, giving them the Ten Commandments. I don't know about you, but I love to experience Jesus, don't you? I love it. I love it. And, and, and you know, it's even a greater pleasure that I get to, to do that with a group of guys today who uh, I get to go way back with. In fact, the, uh, the worship leader, Bidge, um, he's actually a native to Citrus County. Uh, he, he's actually from Inglis, and um, if we can call that a town, okay? Um, but he is from Inglis, all right? And, uh, and, uh, but just a great friend of mine and, uh, again, went to college and then met these other guys uh, while we were there and uh, just a great group of guys, great hearts. Um, and real quick, I just want to kind of share what God is doing uh, through them and in them. Uh, for the past two years, they've actually been on tour uh, with Lifeway Christian Stores. I don't know if many of you know who or what that is, uh, but a major Christian store company across the nation. Uh, they do a lot of mission trips. They have a lot of camps. Uh, and so th- this band, their band name is Immerse. Um, they've actually been touring for two years with Lifeway doing uh, leading worship at conferences and camps, Centra Kids, Centra Feud, you name it, they've done it. Uh, just a lot of great things going on in the life of this band, and God is just working in a mighty way to hear some of the things that they've been through and some transitions and to hear the history, uh, to see it from the beginning to what it is now is just incredible. And uh, so again, just uh, we want to thank them for being here and taking time. Uh, they, they drove in late last night, got up early this morning, helped us set up, and they'll be headed right back to the panhandle after service today. But again, just make sure you thank them so much for what God is doing and also you'll have uh, a time after service if you'd like to invest in their ministry they have some cds and things with them that you can also find them on itunes as well uh, and so you can do that uh, but again thank you for being at reflections church today it's exciting not only because we have this great band here and they're leading and and all these things are going on it is exciting too that we're starting a new season at, in the life of reflections church but let me tell you why else it's really exciting to be here today And that's because we're starting a new series today. In fact, on the ends of some of the benches, you find a card that you also had last week. That's a great invitation card for you to be able to hand to somebody. It's got our website, our meeting time. It tells them what series we're in at the time. So take those. We have more on the back table. Easy invite to hand to somebody at work or at dinner or whatever it is. Uh, But take those. They're they're yours, free to use them. So make sure you use them. Uh, But we're starting this new series. As you see, it's called 10. Um, And again, some of you saw the video on social media and things like that. But we're going to take the next several weeks, and we're going to dig into the Ten Commandments. And and I I was waiting for that moment all week to say that, because as I look across your faces, I don't see a lot of enthusiasm, okay? I don't see it, because the Ten Commandments, I understand, are very, uh, they can be very boring at times. They can be uh, unenthusiastic. They really are. I mean, it's the Old Testament, but we're going to take over the next several weeks the Ten Commandments, and we're going to make them the most relevant and exciting thing in your life. And we're going to hopefully realize and revive the fact that the Ten Commandments are very important to the way that we live our lives each and every day. And so are you in for the journey? Excellent. That sounds great. Well, here we go. Week one of the series 10. And here, here's what I did. I, I, I looked at the, 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 the Ten Commandments and I said, you know what? I love to look at different perspectives. I love to look at different perspectives. So I said, let me do some research. Google is just an incredible, it'll get me in trouble, but it, it's a great tool to use. So I start researching, right? I'm typing in the Ten Commandments, worldviews on the Ten Commandments. I'm looking up opinions on the Ten Commandments. I'm looking up all these different things, and I'm coming across articles and blogs and websites and all this kind of stuff, and I want to know what the world looks at and what the world thinks when they hear and they see the word Ten 
commandments. Now, many of you in here, I could ask you the same question, and it, it would vary across this entire auditorium. You would all give me different answers, but I found three answers that seem to be the most typical uh, and the majority of my research online. So here's what I want to look at today. Number one, the world thinks that the Ten Commandments are God's wishes. They think there's God's wishes. Now, we got to get past what the Ten Commandments are before we get into the Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? Otherwise, if we don't, you won't know how to apply it. So the world, number one, thinks that the Ten Commandments are God's wishes. Now, here's my thing is I wish a lot of things, okay? I wish I had more money. I wish I had, uh, I mean, I can't have a more beautiful wife, so we can't go there. But I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting brownie foot, and you like that? But I, there's a lot of things that I wish for. There's a lot, there's a truck, I have a dream truck, I want that truck, that's my wish. You know, a great example I think is funny, uh, uh, anytime we go on vacation, uh, is, since we've been here, we used to have to travel with our dog and stuff like that, but uh, now we, we have my parents, and so the dog can stay at my parents and that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, he used to get car sick, okay, and so it's just not, it's just not a good thing for us, but, but here's the thing is when we moved here, the dog can stay with them, but now we've also added a few other animals into our life, okay, nothing major, uh, but in our living room, we have a 50-gallon uh, aquarium, okay, it's got a, a few uh, plectomus or however you say it, fish sucker fish okay got a couple a couple of those we got some goldfish we got another really cool big fish that we call blanky uh just because bentley can say it um and uh but we have this 50 gallon fish tank but bentley also has a 10 gallon aquarium in his room with some more goldfish now i say all that to say this that when we go on vacation i usually say something along the lines to my mom or my dad like this if you get a chance can you just go and feed the fish once a day just once a day if you get a chance, if you don't, that's okay. But, but if you get a chance, can you, and that, see, that's my wish. However, dogs are a completely different story. Because, see, I took the initiative and took the dog to their house, so they, 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 they can't forget. Do you see where I'm getting with that, though? Is that the fish is my wish. If you get to it, you get to it, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay, too. The dog, on the other hand, got to feed him. And if you don't, he'll let you know. Promise. But see, the world looks at the Ten Commandments like that. The world looks at the Ten Commandments, and many of you may be looking at the Ten Commandments and say, well, those are just God's wishes. He wrote those down in the Old Testament for us to, if, if we want to obey it, that's okay. But if not, that's okay too. And we kind of have this, um, uh, this, this persona of the Ten Commandments of, I, I don't have to, but I could. So number one, the world thinks that the Ten Commandments are God's wishes. Number two, the world thinks that the Ten Commandments, and this is incredible to me, they think that it's just a list of rules. Just a list of rules. And I guarantee, guarantee, and by, by, in fact, by show of hands, how many of you have kids in here? Okay, so it's the overwhelming majority. Now, here's the thing. If you were to ask your kids what the purpose of rules were, you may get this answer. Rules are meant to what? Be broken. That's right. Rules are meant to be broken. Okay, there's rules in my house, and I'll be honest, there's a lot of times that I break them just to aggravate my wife. Now, I would ask the men in here how many of you do that, but that would get you in trouble, okay? But rules are meant to be broken. That's how our world looks at it. Why does our world look at that? Our world looks at the rules to be broken because of the way that we discipline, the way that we encourage our kids, the way that we lead our families because we don't discipline. See, so the world thinks that, oh, rules are meant to be broken. I'm going to push the limit until I can't push it any further. So I guarantee if you ask your kids, what's the purpose of having rules? They're going to say rules are meant to be broken. So no wonder if our world looks at rules to be broken, if our world looks at the Ten Commandments as rules, then they're looking at ten things that they're going to try to what? Break. So no wonder we don't follow them. And the last one that was the overwhelming majority as I did my research, and this one just blows my mind. The world looks at the Ten Commandments as a way, check this out, to manipulate people. Yeah. And I said, well, what does that exactly mean? The world looks at the Ten Commandments as a way to manipulate people. And I started doing some research, and I found a lot of what I would consider hate blogs and hate articles on the church, because they believe that the church uses the Ten Commandments to help to tell the people, you need to give more, you need to give more money, give more time, do this, do that. That's what they believe the Ten Commandments are. It's a way for the church to tell the people of the church and the people of the community what to do and how to do it. So church, this morning, I want to answer this question before we go any further. What are the Ten Commandments? What are they? Are they a list of rules? Are they God's wishes? 
Are they a way for us to manipulate what people do and how they do it? And that's the question we have to answer. So this morning, there's some questions that arise that when you, the Ten Commandments comes up. Number one is this, is that do they still matter? Do the Ten Commandments still matter? They were in the Old Testament, Pastor. They were, oh, that stuff. No, we don't believe in that anymore. I've heard this argument before. They say, well, when Jesus came, he was crucified, he was resurrected, he ascended to heaven. The Bible tells me that when Jesus did that, that the law no longer existed, that he was the law, and it's through the law, Jesus Christ, that we are saved. Yes, very true. A lot of truth behind that statement. However, the Ten Commandments, still relevant to each and every one of us today. Still relevant to each and every one of us today. So do they still matter? Yes, they still matter. Here's the answer that I wrote down as I was studying. I just always write down what, I, what I'm kind of thinking, which that can be scary sometimes too. But uh, let's look. this is what I wrote down. It says the Ten Commandments aren't just rules that were made up for control and manipulation, but a profound, you might want to write this down, but a profound set of guidelines set by a divine creator to lead us to himself. And these are more relevant and important than ever. Check that out. I don't, did, did you get that? They're a profound set of guidelines set by a divine creator to lead us to himself. So they still matter? Yes, they still matter. But there's another question we have to look at, and it's this. What are the intentions of the Ten Commandments? What is the intention of the Ten Commandments? I, I love, because many of you probably this is going through your mind. Number one, the intention of the Ten Commandments is this, is to bring unity to the nation of Israel. See, we've been talking lately about Joshua. We've been talking about the nation of Israel and going to the promised land and conquering the promised land and doing our laps around the city and watching the walls tear down and watching God do amazing things in the nation of Israel. Now, what we're studying today, and we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, if you'd like to flip there or scan the QR code in the back or whatever. So if you want to get there, that's fine. But what we're looking at is Exodus chapter 20. This is pre-Joshua. This is pre, before anything ever happened with Joshua, we're in the days of Moses today. And so what we see in Exodus chapter 20 is Moses writing down and inscribing the Ten Commandments on the tablet. But to truly understand the story, we're going to have to jump back to Exodus chapter 15 for just a second. Because in five short chapters, a lot takes place. In five short chapters, we see the nation of Israel struggle with idolatry. We see them, that they, they, they start making decisions that are ungodly. They start seeking other gods because the, the true God, the God of Moses, does not seem to be doing what they want him to do. So we see a lot take place. And so they're falling away from the nation of Israel. Are you with me today, church? They're falling away from the nation of Israel. Does that sound familiar to anybody about our world today? We're falling away from the ways of God. We're falling away from the ways of God. And so check this out. The first intention is to bring unity to the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel was in shambles. They were broken. In fact, the nation of Israel was made up by two different groups of people with two different beliefs, two different sets of morals, two different sets of guidelines. And somehow they came together in Egypt. Moses rescued them from bondage, brought them into the wilderness for a very, very, very long time. They're struggling. They haven't eaten. They're looking for provision. They start seeking other gods. They're falling away from the ways of God. And so Moses goes to Mount Sinai, which we talked about a few weeks ago. He goes up there to begin to seek God. He says, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to to respond to their idolatry. I don't know how to respond to their decisions and their seeking of other gods. God, what do I do? And then God begins to do a divine and profound thing. It begins to impress on Moses' heart what we now have is the Ten Commandments. Moses takes the Ten Commandments back to the nation of Israel. And the Ten Commandments began to be the center and the symbol of who God was to the nation of Israel. It was to bring unity to the nation of Israel. But what about us, Pastor? Well, the intention number two of the Ten Commandments is this, to bring humankind back to God. To bring humankind back to God. So you say, are they still important? Yes, very important, very relevant. What's the purpose, Pastor? This, to bring you closer to who Jesus is in your life. So this morning, let's go ahead and dig into Exodus chapter 20, and let's look at the first commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 is where we're going to sit for just a few moments. And this is commandment number one. Do not have other gods besides me. In fact, let's repeat that together. Do not have other gods besides me. 
I have three main principles that I want to hit today. And if you want to write them down, you can. And if not, that's fine too. But number one is this. God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. Real quick, I want you to think. I, think, I, want, I want you to go into the file of your mind. Some of you, I want you to go back 10 years. Some of you, I want to go back 20, 30, 40, maybe 50, 60 years for some of you. But I want you to go back to middle school. Yeah. Go back to middle school. Maybe high school for some of you. But I want you to go back to middle school just for a second. Okay? And I want you to think about something. I want you to think about relationships. Not just best friend relationship. I, I want you to deep dig, or di- dig deep, sorry. And I want you to look into the relationships that you had with the opposite sex. Just for a second. And now what I want you to think about is, I want you to think about that moment where you decided that it was time to break up. You remember the old saying, it's not what? It's not you, it's me. It's not you, it's, just, it, it's me. But I want you to think about that moment where you broke up. And yeah, everything's fine, you break up, it may be mutual, it may not be, whatever. But then I want you to think a little bit further, and I want you to think about when that other person found someone else. Oh, oh, it burns. And I want you to think about the emotion. Now, for some of you, I understand that you may have been the one that found somebody else, okay? But I want you to think about the emotion in that moment. I want you to think about the emotion, the jealousy that you felt towards someone else or they felt towards you. Because at some moment in our life, each and every one of us has experienced jealousy. And I want you to keep that in your mind for just a few moments. Because number one, God is a jealous God. Look look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. It says, and this is again from, from, from Moses talking, or the leadership of the nation of Israel talking to the nation of Israel. He says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, someone tell me, are you there? The Lord is what? One. The Lord is one. Capital O. We're not talking about a little O, just, oh, you know, he's, he's just God, you know. Whatever. God is. God is one. He's saying there is no other. Nothing can take the place of God. Again, the nation of Israel is struggling with idolatry. They're they're, they're creating calves like we talked about out of gold and silver because they want to worship something instead of someone. And they're looking in every direction and every avenue. And then the nation of Israel addresses them and says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is no other. But then if we go further into verse 13 and 14, we see this. He says, fear the Lord your God and worship him and take your oaths in his name. And do, this is the important part, do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. Church, understand this today. The world around you, they're going to do their own thing. They're going to pull you. They're going to prod you. They're going to try to get you to go their way. But understand one thing that a very wise man named Joshua one day said something very profound. He said, as for me and my household, what? We will serve the Lord. See, the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is being addressed. They're saying, hey, I just want you to know that the world is not going to be for you in this sense. The world is going to pull you. The world is going to drag you through the mud and over the asphalt. And you're going to be scraped and you're going to be burned. And it's going to hurt. But remember one thing, that God is one. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord because he is one. My prayer is that you men in here today, the fathers, the husbands, that you would make a commitment and say, as for me and my house, we're serving Jesus. He is the only one. He is the only one. But see, the nation of Israel, they didn't grasp that. And they had to be reminded numerous times. You know what? We have to be reminded numerous times. But look what happened. Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 6 shows us the result of not keeping God first. Jeremiah, if you want to turn with me, chapter 25 verse 6. And it says this, Do not follow other gods and to serve them and to worship them. And do not provoke me to anger by the work of your hands. And then I will do you no harm. Church, you know what that means? It means this. That if we provoke God to anger through idolatry, and through putting things before him, 
destruction comes. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. You know what? It may not even be this week, next month, next year. But you know what? There's going to come a time where you fall flat on your face and God's going to give you a wake-up call because you haven't placed him first in your life. Destruction comes. So number one, God is a jealous God. Remember I told you to think about middle school? I want you to think about the very last step of that process. When that other one found someone else, that other significant other, all of a sudden you become the FBI. You begin to do research. And you know what? You know what happens? Let's be honest. Through research, you begin to try to devise plans to bring destruction to that relationship, don't you? You try to do whatever you can do to split that thing down the middle. Just like the old saying, well, if I can't have you, nobody else can have you. Church, I want to tell you something today. God is a very jealous God. And he, just like us, is jealous of others and other things. And if he's not first in your life, he will find a way to destroy what is. Did you catch that? If he's not first in your life, he will find a way to destroy what is. So number one, God is a jealous God. Number two is this. Other gods do not necessarily have to be popular gods or religious gods. So real quick, let's tackle the idea of idolatry. You say, well, pastor, uh, you know, this is a great commandment. Do not have other gods besides me. Yeah, I'm not going to worship Buddha. I'm not going to worship the Hindu. You know, I'm not going to do that. Okay, that's great. But that's not exactly what we're talking about today. Now, this is the point all week that I've been studying that I'm like, well, if someone's going to walk out, it's going to be right here. Because here's the thing is that each and every one of us struggles with idolatry each and every day. We're faced with it. It may not be another religious God or another popular God. You may not struggle with Jehovah Witness or Mormon. I shouldn't, you you probably do struggle with them. It's just that they're at your doorstep. But you may not struggle, you may not struggle with Hinduism or Judaism. However, let me tell you what you probably do struggle with. You struggle with priorities. Ready for this one? You struggle with addiction. Church, these are the gods that the Ten Commandments is talking about. It's talking about that anything that you place and invest more in than God. Not Hindu, not Judaism, not Mormonism, not, you know, not none of those. Does it apply to those? Yes. But we struggle with something very much more. And it's anything that we invest more in than God. I heard a very wise guy one time just shocked the, just everything out of me. Sitting in his living room. It was a pastor of mine that I was under leadership with. And he said, Taylor, he said, uh, he said you know, a lot of people have this, this priority list. They say, you know, God's first, and then my family, and then work or school. Those are my top three. He said, I don't believe that. This is a pastor. Got the PhDs, a doctor, all that kind of stuff. He said, I don't believe that. So I had to go a little bit further. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, Taylor, he said, understand this, that my family will never be sacrificed for the body of Christ. He said, because my family is who God has given me to be in leadership and authority of, to bring up in the way of the Lord. He said, so number one on my list is my family, period. He said, God's number two. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, God's supposed to be number one. That's what the Ten Commandments tells us. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, Taylor, he said, my family is centered around the name of Jesus Christ. And when I put my family first, God is right smack dab in the middle. See, church, we have priorities. And you may not struggle with these other gods, But I can guarantee that each and every one of us has invested more time this week or this month or this year in something other than God. And I'm not saying money. I'm not saying your money has to be invested. I'm saying our time in personal communion with God. The time you spend in the word every day. The time that you spend in prayer every day. The time that you spend in evangelism and speaking of your church and of your community and what God has done. Church, the most powerful thing you have been equipped with is your story. Share it. Anything that you invest more in than God is a God, lowercase g. 
So God is a jealous God. And also other gods do not necessarily have to be popular gods or supernatural gods. They can be the simple everyday things that Satan uses to pull you away. I want you to take a look at something. When I was in college, and some of these guys from the band will probably recognize this. When I was in college, I took a psychology class, which was crazy to me because I took it before my wife did it. She was a psychology major, so it didn't make sense. But I took a psychology class. And I went into it, and I said, you know what? It's psychology. I don't need this. You ever had something like that? I don't need this, but I have to take it, so I take it, right? I remember walking into class, first couple of days, it's real easy, you know, whatever. I get the book, start doing all the work and all that kind of stuff. And I thought to myself, I'll never use any of this. And then last week came. Yeah, that's how it works, right? And as I'm studying and I'm looking at who God is and looking at what he's asked us, uh, ask of us and his guidelines that he set in the Ten Commandments. And something pops into mind. It's a pyramid. And I'm fixing to put it up on the screen for you. And this pyramid is going to symbolize what a man named Maslow says that we need to be successful and what we need to survive from a worldly perspective. So I want you to take a look at this real quick. This is Maslow's, it's called a hierarchy of needs. And if you notice at the bottom, the very bottom says physiological. We need health, we need food, we need sleep. Then if you move up the pyramid, it says safety. We need shelter. We need removal from danger. We need homes. We need those kinds of things. Going up, we see belonging. We need love. We need affection. We need to be parts of groups like Reflections Church. We long for that as human beings. Then you go up esteem. You need self-esteem. You need esteem from others. You need people to lift you up. That's what we need in our world today. And at the very top, you see self-actualization, which is achieving individual potential. And according to Maslow, these are the things you need in life to survive and to be successful. These are the things you need to be provided for. And I think it's very interesting, church, that the one thing that is not on the list of Maslow is the one thing that could provide every single one of those. Are you with me? We need physiological things. We need safety. We need belonging. We need esteem. We need self-actualization. We're not going to argue or debate those things. But I do find it very interesting that the one thing that's not on there could give us every single one of those things. And his name is Jesus. If we put Jesus at the top of that, everything else falls into place. In fact, the Bible gives us a lot of evidence with that. In fact, Romans eight twenty eight. many of you know it says that everything will be okay. I'm paraphrasing, but everything will be okay for those who trust in the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. If we put Jesus at the top, do what he's asked of us. Everything we've ever needed is provided for. doesn't mean you won't struggle, but everything we've ever needed and will ever need is in the name of Jesus Christ. Another scripture we see is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which is another very familiar, very popular verse. And if you know it, you can say it with me. Seek first. We don't even have to go any further. Seek first, and the kingdom of God will be provided. You get where we're going here, church? Seek first. Seek first. Principle number three, as we get ready to close today, if the band wants to come up, is this. Placing God first trumps my needs second, but it places a supernatural power in control to fulfill my necessities. Catch it, church. Read that again. Placing God first trumps my needs to second. It's not important anymore. But it places a supernatural power in control who can fulfill the things that I need. Man, I want you to look at me. I want to address you real quick. Because as we enter into a new season of Reflections Church, I want you to know that you are an influential 
an important part of what's about to take place in the community of Citrus Springs. But let me tell you this, you can't do it, period. Lee, Barry, Kevin, Rob, Stan, Carl, you guys can't do it. But I tell you who can. His name is Jesus. And if we place him first in our lives and in our families, everything will be provided for. So first today, men, men of God, I want you to know that it's you who is responsible for the family that sits next to you. The family that lives under your roof, they're your responsibility. And as men, we need to follow commandment number one, which is to put no other gods besides me. Very interesting, over the past week, started into two devotional plans, and I don't, I, I don't typically do two. Started into two devotional plans just about five days ago. I started in one that was parenting. I started one that has to do with marriage. Because you know what? A lot of times I feel inadequate to be either of those. But God's been working on me a lot lately when it comes to family. Not only my family, but your families. Because see, as one of your pastors here at Reflections Church, I'm devoted to building and equipping your family in the name of Jesus too. And as God's been working on me and my family, God's been giving me a heavy heart for your families. So men, again I say, do not let anything intrude your house that is not in the name of Jesus. Period. I understand too, there's probably a lot of single moms here or maybe single dads. That applies to you too. Do not let anything intrude your house that's not in the will and the name of Jesus Christ. I think we failed as families. But here's the thing, is that we may fail, but there's an opportunity to come and to get right in the name of Jesus Christ. So today as the band begins to play, here's, here's what I think God wants of us today. First of all, I, I think he wants the men to step up out of obedience and say, I will be a mighty man. I will be a mighty man. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My kids will know about Jesus. I will pray with my kids. I will read with my kids. I will talk to my kids about what they may be struggling with. In my marriage, I'm going to pray with my wife. I'm going to read with my wife. I'm going to dig with my wife. I'm going to pray with my wife that we could be committed and devoted parents to bring our children up in the name of Jesus Christ. Men, that's you. That's you. So this morning, I want the men to stand up, even maybe literally stand up in the moment and say, God, I will. But men, understand something, that you did not do it alone either. For those of you who have a wife and a family, I want them to stand with you. And I want them to say, we will. We will. There is no name above the name of Jesus Christ in the household of the Robertsons or of the Higgs or of the Coles, of the Hoffmans. There's no other name but Jesus. That's the commitment that God is calling each and every one of us to today and in this moment. You say, well, why, Pastor? Why would he call us to that? Understand this. Jesus paid it all for you. And all he's asking is to commit your family in the name of Jesus to raise your kids up and to lead your family in the word of God and in the will of Jesus Christ. So I ask you today, church, I ask you today, who will? Who will? Vic is in. Who will? Who will? Yeah, who will? Who will? 
In the name of Jesus, we will as the men of Reflections Church. Men, as you remain standing, I want to ask something else. Who's going to be there with you? Who will be there with you? Wives, children, teenagers, if you're there, stand up. Because in the name of Jesus, this church will be full and mighty of mighty men and families. We will. In fact, you know what? Let's add something to that statement. We will because he did. We will because he did. Church, do you get it? Jesus paid it all. And he's asking us to be mighty men and women and families to reach and to place a fat dent on the planet for Jesus Christ. Everybody say, we will. Everybody say, he did. Everybody say, we will go. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus faded all. Oh.